such an intense opening. <laughs> Welcome to Foothills Christian Church. I'm Douglas Peak, and I'll be sharing your message today. If you're watching online for the first time, or if you're here for the first time, we are glad you were here. If you accept an invitation of somebody, we are just so glad that uh, you are participating. One of the things about our church is to coach you up in your faith, whether you even started that journey or not, or if you're very mature in that faith. We want to coach you up, and basically that means we want you to think for yourself. Otherwise, someone else will do it for you. Uh, Carl Jung said this, thinking is difficult, therefore let the herd pronounce its judgment. And so his point is, is that when you don't think for yourself, the crowd tells you what to do, and when you follow the crowd, you become a sheeple, okay? Now, we're sheep, but we are not sheeple. Okay, and that's a very important distinction. Jesus Christ said it a little bit differently, but I think more effectively he said, look. He said, uh, narrow is the gate to life and few are those who find it. Now, what was he trying to say is it's like there's this hidden gate out in a forest and you stumble around and go, oh, the gate to life, woohoo, found it. Or was he trying to say is that it's something that you really have to intentionally think through and consider uh, Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, you must count the cost. You see, these are statements that you really got to think for yourself and make up your own mind and decide for yourself. So regardless of where they're at, if you're brand new here and you're kind of skeptical of the God thing, or if you're a very mature follower of Christ, any step that you want to take, we want to encourage you to take in growing your faith. You can uh, scan this QR code. If you're watching online, you can do that. There's, uh, it takes you to help uh, different ways of things offered to help you do that. We love QR codes because it allows you to do it anonymously to check things out. Also, uh, if you're on campus, there's a Connect card. It's on the back of the chair in front of you. It's often, it allows you to write prayer requests on there. Elders pray over those things. Staff pray, prays over those things every single week. So you can drop that Connect card in the orange box on your way out. They are at the back of the auditorium. Also, we have a connection booth out there, and it's an opportunity to just see what's available to help you grow in your faith. So <clears throat> please avail yourself of that. We're currently in a series called The Five Rational Proofs That God is Real. Quick review of what we introduced last week. And that is, number one, what you believe is one of the most important things about you uh, have you ever wondered why you do certain things? You know, it's like, uh, let's say you're single and you're dating, and it's like, man, I always, I always, you know, kind of shipwrecked or sink or trip up that relationship. Why do I always do that? Why is that? Or you're in a situation that's new, and it's like, you know, I always pull back, and I don't, I don't say something like I should, and I always regret not saying something. You know, you're, you're in a college class, you know, and the professor's railing against something you believe, and you think, why do I just sit there and take that? Or, you, know, if you, you know, we all have these things about ourselves that we go, why do I do that? Well, it's because it's driven by a subconscious belief that you're not aware of. And so, so our goal is to help you in your faith by clarifying what you believe, what you truly believe. And the first step in doing that is by answering the most important question of all. Now, Aristotle believed that this was the most important question of all, and he got the ball rolling 400 years before Christ was born. And he asked the question this way, why is there something instead of nothing? Why is there something instead of nothing? In other words, why, are, why does this reality exist? Why are there human beings? Now, today, particularly in Western society, it has grown into a same question, but a different form. And that form is this. Is there a God? 
And the reason why is because if you're going to determine whether there is something, which we all agree there is something, and it got here, it either got here by God or something else, which an atheist would say, nothing. So there's this comparison that they're asking. Now, this is what I think is really interesting, is people who are theists or people who believe in God always say, well, it's the most important question to, to ask because God is real, and let me tell you about God, so forth and so forth and so forth. And so that's to be expected, right? What I find really interesting is every single book that I've read by every atheist asks the same question. They spend all their time writing about there is no God. They name their books God Delusion, the God Mistake, you know, the, the mean God of the Old Testament. And I'm like, for somebody who doesn't believe in God, you sure use his name a lot in the titles of your books. <laughs> it's strange to me. I've never read a book from an atheist on how to have a happy and full life. The atheist's 10 steps to a full life. Go on Amazon, see if you can find one, because I couldn't find one. You know, I've never read an atheist's approach to the 10 best business practices, right? You never, I have never read an atheist's book, The Atheist's Guide to French Cooking. <laughs> Man, if you can't write a recipe book, you're suspect in my mind. So the answer to this question, I think is so important to theists and non-theists, is because it forms the basis for all your other beliefs your conscious and subconscious beliefs, whether you know it or not. So <clears throat> we're in this series to help you figure out what you really believe and are convinced of about this. This is your work, not my work. When we evaluate the rational proofs for the existence of God, we discover that what we really believe inside and we believe what we, what we look at and say, is it rational or irrational to believe what I believe? So that's, that's really an important question. The reason why is because you live in a world that insults you about faith all the time. But it's fascinating by studying these proofs. Here, this is an abstract point, but I want you to think about it. Is that you don't even have to agree with the conclusion of the proof to see that it is a rational syllogism or a rational proof. And the whole point is, is that how you end up coming down on the answer is a rational process. So nobody who's intellectually honest can say that your belief based on these proofs is irrational. And that's what we're trying to do. When you think about the importance of rational thinking, it becomes a foundation for powerful convictions. If you want to be a real man or a real woman in this world, uh, filled with strength and confidence, and you want to tackle life, you want to know who you are and why you're here, then strengthen your convictions. And that's what this series is about, to help you grow stronger. I want you to grow stronger mentally, and I want you to grow stronger morally. I want you to have a, a deeper ability to think for yourself. Uh, and all of this results in a stronger emotional life. And so uh, our first proof that we introduced last week was called the moral proof, okay? And the moral argument proves that God exists because all human beings are moral beings. And if you want to dig into that, you can go and listen to last week's message. Now, what's really interesting is I podcast on all of these things as well, I've been podcasting for quite a while. As a matter of fact, I started podcasting I don't know, four years ago. I have almost 400 episodes of podcasting, okay? And that means 200 hours of what I call bloviation. <laughs> you know, opinion about, I just talk about, talk about it. We, every Tuesday, we drop a, a study of the Bible, of what does this text actually say? And then on Thursday, we drop an episode, that's, each one's 30 minutes approximately long, about how this applies to, you know, I would like to say it's the fastest growing podcast in America today. <laughs> I'd like to say that, but that's not true. <laughs> As a matter of fact, nobody listens to my podcast for a long time until the BLM riot started uh, during COVID. And so a lot of pastors were putting up uh, the black square, you know, on their Instagram or on their, you know, various thing. And I was like, uh, I think I need to, ch I, kind of what I said is, this salty old dog here just needs to help all you guys realize, be careful what you 
or jumping on the bandwagon for. And it's called Beware of the Bandwagon episode. This was a long time ago. And what happened is I got in there. I said, you have to understand where this organization comes from. And it's a Marxist organization that comes from this thing called critical race theory. And this thing in critical race theory comes from these philosophers from the Frankfurt School of Critical Theory. And this is where it's developed and so forth and so forth. So I'm in the history and derivation of stuff. And people were like, oh, okay, pastor, I'd never heard about that. I didn't know that, blah, 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 blah. Well, three months later, the president of the United States stands up and starts talking about critical race theory and all this kind of stuff. And people are like, my pastor's a prophet. <laughs> and I said, no, I just read a book, <laughs> you know. Um, so, so what happened is that everybody started sharing it and, and it kind of blew up. So it, today, you know, I don't know, it has a listenership or followership, I don't know, somewhere between 500 and 800 people, which I love. We, I call them the salty crew and uh, they're, they're faithful, they're awesome. So I, I've been doing this for years. Not a lot of people listen to it. Da, da, da. It has its own YouTube channel. And then I did this series and it blew up because the internet trolls have come out and decided to comment on the five proofs of God. So there's a lot of things that I am that you know had no idea that your pastor was. But I can't repeat those things in polite company. So just let you know that, okay? So if you want to see a new dimension of me, just go read the comments on some of the videos for the podcasting. And, you know, they say all this kind of crazy stuff. And I just want you to know that something that's really interesting about me is uh, Jesse says, hey, there's people commenting. I don't think you need to comment a lot, but you might want to kind of respond. And most people today think, well, cultural Christianity in America has become very weak, and that is because as their virtue, they believe, is the most important thing is to be nice. I'm salty. <laughs> I believe in being good and being true. And so, you know, I answer back in my way. <laughs> and what's so interesting is how vitrolic and nasty people are. And you click on their little thing, you know, oh, who is this person, you know, and it goes to nowhere and they, they don't have their name on it. My name is everything I post. It says Douglas Peak right there, you know. You can read my profile, you know, pastor, church in Idaho, so everybody knows. But they hide behind things, you know, you have no idea who these people are. They have no subscribers, they have no followers, they have no nothing. And they throw out all these crazy things about you and stuff like that. I think it, it, it's just so this. Why do I bring that up? Because what we're doing here is so critically important because there is a group of people out there who spend all their trying, time trying to tell you that your belief in God is irrational. Okay? And I am here to tell you that they are liars. Amen. What they're doing to you is deception. It's a false accusation. They may disagree with your conclusion. They may disagree with your outcome. But they are liars when they say that you've come to this conclusion irrationally. And that faith is irrational. Because that is completely false. When you evaluate their reasoning, their attempts at logic, their false use of language, and their inability to interact with simple basic proofs without expressing some kind of extreme hatred towards you or towards me, it proves that their belief system is more of a religion than any reasonable expression of intelligence. And that's the truth. Amen. So with that in mind, let's see if we can rile up those crazy people. And jump into a new one. Okay, our proof today is this. This one's more abstract, okay? And before I get to the proof, I, I want to talk a little about but where it comes from. This one's more abstract, but it has a deep, long history. And I love the history of where it came from. And what it shows you is how rational this proof is, okay? So it starts off with this guy named Aristotle. And Aristotle was uh, uh, around 400 years before Christ was born. And he started off, he asked the question, why is there something instead of nothing? And so he w worked on this stuff called causation. What causes what happens, okay? And then right after that, Paul br brings up the exact same issue of causation or first cause, and that's what this argument is based on. It's called the cosmological argument. It's about causes. And it, it's all about where does things come from and why did they happen? And I'll read it to you really quick in chapter 1 of his letter to the Colossians, beginning with verse 15. It says, And Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. 
For by him all things were created, that's a statement of cause, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created by him and for him. And he is before all things. So if you're in a cause effect reality, which you are, and I'll talk about that in a moment, and in him all things hold together. He is the, also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself might come to have first place in everything. So the whole point is, is that Paul talks about this causal argument of where things come from, and it's Christ, okay? Then in the 13th century, there's Thomas Aquinas. If you have a Roman Catholic background, you've heard of him. He wrote one of the most greatest pieces of literature, of ancient literature. It's called the Summa Theologica. It's these five giant books about the theology of God. And in it, he says, this is how I can prove that God exists. And four of his five arguments revolve around this specific argument of causation. Then there is Gottfried Leibniz. Uh, he was very involved in this. What's really interesting is it was he and Newton that created calculus. So he's considered one of the greatest general geniuses that have ever lived in the world. Okay. And then today, the person who actually articulates it and defends it the best is Dr. William Lane Craig. I encourage you, uh, if you're on YouTube or anything else, uh, he puts out these little clips. They're awesome. They're wonderful. Devour anything you can from Dr. William Lane Craig. Now let's throw the proof up there and let's see how it works. Now remember how a syllogism works is you have a premise and you have to ask yourself, is the premise true or do I refute the premise? And then the second premise has to be true or false. But if both are true, then the conclusion is necessary. In other words, you have to accept it. You can't deny it. And here's how it works. Everything that begins to exist has a cause. Okay? So we live in a cause and effect reality. It's called the space-time continuum. All right? We'll talk a little bit more about the scientific background to this. Number two, the universe began to exist. So today we know that the universe is not infinite like it was believed. As a matter of fact, a lot of people don't know this, but uh, Albert Einstein when he proposed his theory of relativity, which is still a phenomenal thing, we'll talk about that in a moment, but he also added what is known as the cosmological constant. And what he did is he said, in order for my math to work, I have to have an infinite thing. Later on, once they discovered that there was a beginning to the universe, he said, that was one of my, one of my greatest mistakes, was having that. So he talked specifically about that. But everything that begins to exist has a cause, the universe began to exist, therefore, the universe has a cause. You see how simple that is? But what's amazing about it, this is what I love about the power of this proof, is that it is so simple. What it does is, well, it starts with something just so basic, it's eloquent. When Einstein proposed his theory of relativity, you know what mathematicians called it? They called it eloquent. They said the beauty of the math is in its simplicity. And so by attempting to approve the minimum in such a basic, eloquent way, what you do is you unleash a cascade of logic that forces the acceptance of truth. Have you ever been in one of those situations where you, uh, you see those guys that try to break the domino falling record? Have you ever seen some of those things where they take out a building, a, a gym or something, they set up all these dominoes and they have them all set up and they make all these designs and sometimes they'll make a the face of a president, you know, and a flag and all this kind of stuff. So you see this huge thing and they have the cameras rolling. And how does it all start? The guy gets down there, the gal gets down there. And what do they do that very first domino? They go, blink. And then what does it do? It starts out this chain reaction that does all this amazing stuff. But it all begins with one little blink. And what's amazing is that this proof is exactly like that. Is when you adopt this proof, you understand this proof, you answer, this is true. What happens is that you click that little thing and what it does is it unleashes a cascade of logic that pulls you to this conclusion. There is no other option that there, than there is a God. Okay? Now, what you believe is the first cause has a huge implication on your life. So in the thing, everything begins to exist, universe began to exist, the universe has a cause. 
So the question then becomes, what is the cause? What is it? And what you believe is the first cause has a huge implication on your life. Once you believe the proof, you've gone click, and now all those falling dominoes say, what is the cause? And what's amazing to me is how many people are starting to realize how irrational our society has become. It's not rational anymore. It's becoming irrational. We'll talk about why that is in a moment. But uh, people have called me eclectic. Uh, other people call me weird. Um, and that's because, you know, I, I spent a lot of time reading the scripture. I have spent a lot of time reading uh, philosophy and history and stuff. And, and, you know, and then I'll listen to like Joe Rogan. So um, <laughs> people say, that's just weird, Pastor. Well, he had Aaron Rodgers, right, the quarterback, on and they were talking and the thing that was so interesting to me about it is that you know Aaron Rodgers you know you never know quite what you're going to get out of him it depends on whether he's coming off a, a hallucinogenic mushroom trip or not and uh, <laughs> so it's always kind of weird you just never know but what's really fascinating is Rodgers Aaron Rodgers says to him don't you think Joe that there has to be some value that orients people I mean something that says let's try and do things better because there's a right and wrong and Joe Rogan this is what he says he goes Unfortunately, the problem with living in a secular society, living in a society where lots of people are atheists, they have no belief system at all. So you go out and find a belief system. And that's what a lot of these people who call themselves atheists, they subscribe to the religion of woke. Their God is equity and inclusiveness. Their God is this ideology they think that you have to subscribe to, and that's why it's so spooky. Human beings have a very strong desire for some sort of order, form, or pattern that they can follow. That seems the right way to go. But they can be led by cults, by groups of people, intolerant governments, evil armies, and corrupt politicians. As time goes on, people are going to need, uh, going to, need to see the need for a divine structure for things, some sort of belief in the sanctity of love and of truth, and a lot of that comes from religion. He, he kind of says a few more things about it, and then he says, I guess in the end, the world needs Jesus. And here's a guy who doesn't believe in Jesus. You see, the strength of this proof is what, what, what you just witnessed him saying is somebody went clink, and then it results in this conclusion. And, and that's the power of this proof, is that it forces you into a path of thinking where you start thinking more clearly and you draw the right conclusions about your life. The other reason I like this proof is because it's built on scientific facts that are already proven. If you go back and you read some of the, uh, the um, commentators in the comment section of uh, The Salty Pastor, uh, what was so interesting is that they, they use a lot of uh, flowery language. Uh, it reads like French and uh, to describe what, you know, I'm postulating. And what's really interesting is I, I would just say to them, I say, look, you, you're proving my point. You're irrational. What, uh, a proof is something that you have to interact with and then you determine the answer. And to one guy, I just said, I said, look, you're proving my point. I said, I don't care what you think. I really don't care. And here's why. You might think that's cold, but we got to get over this whole notion that Christianity is nice. No, Christianity is righteous, good, and true. And some people hate that. Okay, they hate that, and they fight against it. But I just simply said, I don't care what you think. This guy, you know, typing on his parents' internet, on a couch in a basement somewhere, it, is, it has no impact when I stand before the judgment seat of Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 10, stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account for the life that I lived. God's not going to go, hmm, looks like in the comment section of something you said there, <laughs> radboy385 says... Jeez, jeez, don't, that dog don't hunt with Jesus, I'm just saying. It just it doesn't work. And guess what? The opposite is true. Nothing I say, nothing, no argument I make is going to make any difference when that guy or gal stands before God and gives an account. You know what they give an account for? What they thought, what they believed, and what they thought. And so 
I don't care what you think. I don't care where you come down on the proof. I just care that you took the time to actually think about it like a rational person. No one can be forced to believe in God. Nobody forced to follow Christ. You, it, it doesn't work that way. What it works is people discover him. It says they knock and the door is open. They seek, they find. They say, I want to know the truth and the reality of my existence. And they always find it in Christ. And so my point is to whet the appetite. Say, I, it doesn't matter what I think. I told them, what I think is completely irrelevant. What matters is what you think. Because that's what counts. And the beauty of this proof is that it forces them to interact with the premise. And the premise is everything that begins to exist has a cause. That is the three laws of Newtonian physics. I have a graph for you, by the way, if you've forgotten. Okay, here they are, the, the, the three laws. Newton's first law of motion, it's called inertia. An object at rest remains at rest, and an object in motion remains in motion at constant speed and in a straight line, unless, this is a causal statement, acted on by an unbalanced force. So unless there's a cause, an action, same thing will happen. Number two, the, acceler the law of force. The acceleration of an object depends on the mass of the object and the amount of force applied. So this is a statement of cause because it depends on what? Mass. Okay, the mass is the cause. Number three, Newton's third law of motion, action and reaction. Whenever one object exerts a force, a cause, on another object, the second object exerts a cause, equal and opposite force on the first. An equal and opposite reaction. These are Newtonian laws of physics. Everything we know uh, up to this point is based on that. So, if you're going to argue the first premise, you're arguing with the laws of physics. And I'm like, you can do that. I'm not going to try. I'm not that smart. Now, but what's really fascinating is the second part of the premise is that we know another scientific proof. And that is, is that the universe has come to an existence. And when Einstein proposes constant, cosmological constant, and then later on what happened is we know, wow, the universe, we actually measured the background radiation and we found out, wow, the universe has a beginning. And it was all, the immensity of the universe, just think about this for a second. You live on the planet Earth, which is pretty big, and it's in a solar system, right? Our solar system is huge, okay? That solar system is a part of a galaxy, that galaxy is part of the Milky Way, right? And the Milky Way is just one part of the entire universe. We cannot begin to understand how massive, the how big the universe really, really is. And guess what? Science said, well, it had a beginning. All of that mass, all of that space, all of that time was in a, a, a something smaller than an electron, and then boom, it, they call it the Big Bang. It exploded, and now it's going in one direction, and it is cooling and running out of energy. So it is not infinite. It's finite. So these are two scientific facts that we know. Therefore, something had to cause this. And here's where it really gets awesome. One, one, of, the, one of the guys on there said this. Uh, he, he's kind of irrational, but he says, the only thing you can get out of this is that something caused the universe to begin. And I wrote back, Exactly. <laughs> That's the point. So, and, and then this is where they get so irrational. I think it's hilariously funny. I said, because a intellectually honest person says, okay, if this is the reality that we have right now, what has the power to create that or cause that to happen? And that is where you start to really see the dominoes fall. You see, the more we know about the universe, the more it tells us about the first cause that caused it. And that's the point of this argument called the cosmological argument. Is 
The more I know about this universe, the more it reveals the nature of the first cause or God. This is the exact point that Paul makes in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, where he says the following. He says, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, that is uh, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen or perceived, being understood through what has been made so that men are without excuse. We are without excuse because we see the invisible attributes, his eternal power, his very nature, in, represented in the creation itself. Therefore, the more we study this, the more it tells us about the first cause. For instance, one of the things we realize is that the universe is so massive, it's so big, so the first cause has to transcend the size of all created universe. So if the universe is finite, then the first cause has to be infinite. In, in the universe in which we live, right, we ha we ha it has to be well, let's just say the laws of physics and the laws of cosmology and the laws of gravity, all of these things that we are learning, we start to realize the amount of knowledge to create this thing or build this thing or cause this thing is so immense. But we're still just scratching the surface. Case in point, did you know that Einstein's theory of relativity is uh, obviously the basis for much of what we know about uh, atomic energy, nuclear energy? It's about how the speed of light and how energy is transformed as you accelerate to the speed of light, how it warps time and all this kind of stuff, right? It's really, really cool. And so much science is built on that. Then we have another aspect of physics. So Einstein's theory of relativity has to do with like really, really big things, right? gravity and time, really, really big things. Then there's another uh, new physics that's come out called quantum physics, quantum mechanics. And it's about really, really, really small stuff. And now we could talk about it, but sometimes I get lost talking about it, right? It's kind of like that third uh, Ant-Man and Wasp movie by Marvel, you know, where they get lost in quantum mania or something. But uh, uh, what happens is, is what's really interesting is that all the laws of quantum mechanics physics contradict Einstein's law of relativity. They contradict each other. And no one knows why. I can't wait till they find the answer. <laughs> well, my point is, is that just think of the immensity of all that knowledge. So it, the first cause caused this. So the knowledge of what we have in the universe today is finite, but this must be all encompassing knowledge, right? Uh, you look at the power, the power of sun and the power of black holes and the power of antimatter, you, you know, dark matter. You look at the, all this power. Well, the first cause has to be more powerful than that in order to create it. Uh, but let's get more personal. Is that what, what's one of the most unique things about human beings? Aren't we creative? Don't we love to build things and make things? And we, we love to be creative, you know? We love to cook and we love art. We love music. Who doesn't love, you know, a great country western song, you know? I mean, we, we love to be creative. We create. Men build. Men are meant to build. And that's a, an expression of their creativity. You know, a lot of times I tell guys, you know, one of the reasons why your life feels flat is when's the last time you built anything? A relationship, a friendship, a business, a company, a family, a kid, uh, you know, anybody. We, we, you know, we, we're meant to build. And when we stop building, we start to, what do you call it, we kind of waste away as men. So we should always build. But guess what? That's our experience, that we can materialistically and objectively say this is true, right? So guess what? The first cause has to possess that and more in order to create it. The, the first cause, this is what's really interesting. This is a very abstract point. But a lot of people who aren't real rational, a lot of people who say that they're intelligent, uh, you know, that criticize people of faith, they never wrestle with this. Until you get to a really honest atheist, then they'll have this discussion with you. But it's really hard because a lot of them won't do it. And that is this. And it is called, uh, in quantum mechanics, the biggest problem with discovery is called observation. Okay? Because the way it works is when you see an atom, you have a nucleus, and then there's a shell around it like an egg. 
there's, it's, a hard, it's a hard sphere. And the reason it's a hard is because the, that electron that surrounds it is traveling it so fast, it creates like a shell. But what happens when you observe it? If you observe it, you don't see a shell. What do you always see in the picture of the atom? You see a nucleus, and then you see this line of an electron rotating around it, right? But that's not how it actually exists. It's a hard sphere that can't be penetrated. That's why you have to build a, an accelerator and smash stuff into it so you can observe it. But as soon as you observe it, guess what happens? You taint the experiment. It's tainted. So you can't have an objective. So that's what they're always wrestling around. I like to read that. It's so fun, you know. And then we can talk about entanglement. No, let's not do that, though. We don't have time for that. Um, you know. So what happens is the first cause, right, the first cause has to possess something greater to create something that in the process of observation, it doesn't taint it. In other words, how do you create something that doesn't change you as the creator in the act of creating? I know this is abstract, but the answer to that is you have to obtain pure free will. So the reason why you have free will and I have free will is because we're created in the image of God. So do you see what happens when you start plink on the, well, the universe has a cause. Okay, it does. So what? So what? It begs all these questions and it forces you to answer them in a way that says there is no other answer, but there is, God is the first cause. So let me leave you with a few real practical things on your way out, okay, uh, to kind of help you. Say, a lot of people are thinking, so what? Well, I want to give you some arguments that help you strengthen your faith, okay? This one in particular, take time to reflect on it, meditate on it, even pray over it. Just think about it. Write it down. It's on our website. It's on our notes. I mean, there's so many different ways to get it. And just think about it. Because the more you meditate on it, the more you become aligned with reality around you, things become more clear to you. You see, this is important because the world in which you live today is struggling with confusion. Our world today is filled with young people struggling with depression and anxiety. People who are confused, wondering what moral choices do I make? It's heartbreaking to see so many people struggling so much. Why, when we chart this, we see the data shows that this is increasing at exponential rates among people in America. Why is that? The reason why is because our society has taught people to think in a way that is irrational and not rational. And when you think irrationally, you end up having mental health issues. Most specifically, this whole proof is about cause and effect. And what our society has done is it has removed the cause and effect thinking about so many things. It has removed the cause and effect thinking about the formation of relationships. So many young people think that what I do before I find the person I say yes to marrying is irrelevant when I find that person and say yes. It's kind of like, hey, what happened in Vegas stays in Vegas. No, what happens in Vegas haunts you for the rest of your life, especially if it's a disease, okay? It just, right? The, how you date, what you do when you date, your interactions, how many partners you have, have an overwhelming influence on the quality of this when it happens. And, and our society has said to young people, ah, do whatever you want, sow your wild oats, because it won't have any effect on finding the love of your life. Oh, yeah, it does. Our society has removed the cause and effect uh, relationship between discipline and outcome. Everybody says, have a dream, dream your dream. Man, pursue your dream. Your dream is the most important thing about you. Never give up on your dream. And nobody ever says, well, how do I execute my dream and see my dream happen? It only happens in one way. That's his discipline. You know, nobody goes around saying, oh, have discipline. It's the greatest thing ever. You know, discipline is awesome. Discipline is fun. Discipline is who you were meant to be. <laughs> nobody ever says that. But we've removed the cause and effect thinking about how important it is. Guess what? Our society has removed the cause and effect relationship between hope and happiness. Everybody wants to be happy. 
And I'm like, man, I so want you to be happy. I want your life to be filled and full. But guess what our society has done is it has removed the notion of hope because what you believe and what you place your hope in is absolutely unequivocally linked to the happiness you experience in your life. And if this isn't figured out, and if you don't have a foundation and a rational, faith-filled, deep conviction of what it is, then you will never experience this ever. And so, so many people are lost. And I'm like, ah! If I could just help you, I want you to know. But I can't. In so many ways, well, I can, but in so many ways, I am a voice. You are a voice in a wilderness crying against a raging storm that says, believe whatever you want, do whatever you want, be whatever you want, and you'll be happy. It's just false. They have... They have removed the cause and effect, which this whole proof is about, relationship between making rational decisions versus emotional decisions. Well, I felt so emotional about it, and it had to be right, and I made it, and how come my life is now so in so much turmoil? Well, maybe if you would have, like, thought about that, you know, a little bit, objectively. Our society has removed the cause and effect relationship uh, between creating your own identity and receiving an identity from an objective source like God. Our society now is telling young people, you can make your identity whatever you want it to be. And guess what? It's always based on what you feel. And you will deny the rational scientific proof about gender, about sexuality. Just ignore all that stuff and you'll make up your own identity. And we wonder why. Young people are suffering. This is a pretty salty thing to say, but you know what? If you're a parent, it is not hard to raise a morally grounded young adult. It's not hard. All you do is you show them cause and effect, choice, outcome, right? That's called disciplining your children. <laughs> you know, you start them young and then you go, okay, you can make this choice or this choice. This one has this outcome. This one has that outcome. And then you always do what? Follow through on the outcome. And you always say, well, that was your choice, not mine. Right? And you follow through on it. Parents know this as basic parenting techniques. So here's something really salty. And that is this, is that moral development is not difficult unless you don't believe in morals. And that's the problem our world has today. It has removed your moral decision-making from any happiness, joy, or identity you will ever have in your life. And when you do that, you will have all kinds of mental health issues. Another thing that this proof does and why you should think on it is that you begin to see how God answers your prayers. You know, prayer over time is such a, a powerful thing, and what it does is it changes you, right, as you do it. Uh, one of the interesting things is, you know, a lot of guys know Pastor Harv. He's been on staff here for about, I don't know, about four years. But he and I have been friends for 35, 36 years. So we knew each other before both of us got married. That's how long we've known each other. And, you know, all, all the years that going by, you know, we'd call on the phone, call on the phone, you know, talk to each other a lot, and he'd call and stuff. And one thing that's so interesting about Pastor Harv is that um, this is a little inside baseball um, for pastors and stuff. You know, my buddies will call me, my other pastor friends, yeah, okay, all right. He goes, hey, I need you to pray about this situation. Okay, I'll write it down, pray about it. He goes, oh, yeah, all right, and then you hang up. You know, pa Pastor Harv does this. He goes, uh, he, 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 Pastor Harv prays like he throws the fastball, right, very quick. Um, so what you do is he goes, let's pray about this. Dear Lord, and then he starts praying. And you're like, oh, oh, we're praying now. It doesn't go on a list that you pray about later. When Pastor Harv says we're going to pray about it, Okay, start praying. <laughs> that's, you know, that's when it happens, right there, right? So it's a wonderful thing. Uh, in first service, uh, his daughter was sitting over there and she shouted out, amen. Um, what, what's interesting about that is what happened is the discipline of that and doing it right away has, has over the years have taught me a lot of things. And one of the things is that I realized when I was younger, I always prayed subjectively. I prayed in a way that is like, well, it's about me, how it impacts me. God, why aren't you answering my prayers? God, why aren't you doing things in my life? And what I started to realize is that I really pray subjectively. But what God is doing is he's saying, well, I'm working objectively outside of your reality, and I'm working in your reality all at the same time. I'm taking quantum mechanics physics, and I'm taking Einstein theory of relativity and popping it all together. And I do not dare ask God how he does that. 
You see what I'm saying? And so what happened is I realized he answers my prayers objectively as well as subjectively. And because of that discipline, you start to learn that over a time. I describe it this way. One of my goals is when I pray is to align myself with what God is doing so that I can say, God, I want to see what you're doing. I want to be a part of what you're doing so that I can enjoy what you're doing, whether it's in me or somebody else. And when you start living life as a surfer, right? A surfer doesn't tell the ocean when the wave comes. All the surfer does is sit there on their board and watch. And then when it comes, they surf it. And they say, that's awesome. And, and that's what I'm trying to do is align myself with God. This proof teaches me cause and effect relationships and how I'm praying and how God answers my prayer objectively as well as subjectively. Finally, it shows me how to have rational conversations with my friends. If you get in a discussion with a friend, you could always return to the premise. You see, anytime they, they criticize it, they say, well, I don't believe in God because God's mean in the Old Testament, or God does this, or God does that, da, 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 da. I always return to the moral argument. I say, well, if there is no God, there's no objective morals or duties, so on what basis do you make a moral judgment that God's bad? Connect that for me real quick before we can go further, and nobody can do it. Say, oh, so you, do, you think it's wrong, so... You're judging God for that? Ooh, I like you, you're my friend, but you're not in God's league. In this one, you say, look, there's a cause and effect. Always return to the premise. And when I was typing and answering some of these guys, I would say this as I go, look, you aren't sufficiently refuting the premise. Interact with the premise. Because this isn't about me, it's about you. And if you really want to be salty or contentious, just type at the end of your statement, you should return to the premise and then say, try harder. <laughs> that always gets them. The reason we're doing this series and the reason why I'm taking time to do this, preaching it longer than normal, is because more than anything else, I want you to grow stronger. I want you to grow stronger in, in, mentally. I want you to grow stronger in your heart. I want you to grow stronger in your convictions because I want you to be the person that you're meant to be and to become that right? You have to be, as Paul says, ready for the battle. And I, this is for you. I, want, I believe we need stronger people, not weaker people in this world. And strength comes from clarity of knowing what you believe and why you believe it. And then when someone tries to say, this is just a bunch of baloney, this is just this is irrational that you could just laugh at them and go, the only irrational person in this conversation right now is you because you can't refute the premise. When you know who you are, why you are here, and what your life was meant to be, that's when you become a stronger person. And that's my hope for you. If you're ready to take another step, Elder will be down here to talk to you after this service. Let's stand for closing prayer. Lord, it's amazing to me how significant our interaction with you can be on us, even though you are the most all-powerful, infinite first cause that we can't even imagine your immensity. Amen. Amen. God bless you. See you next Sunday.